All right. No more cuss words, everybody. All right. <laughs> All right. Well with me. Okay. Just a minute. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Billings Gazette. Thank you for coming here on this uh, Montana spring day, which means snow. Uh, welcome to the <laughs> Billings Gazette editorial endorsement interview for Montana's lone congressional seat. Today we are lucky to have Republican Greg Gianforte and Democrat Rob Quist here to talk about their respective candidacies. This meeting will last about an hour and is being carried on Facebook Live. We want to thank both campaigns for their time and the coordination. Uh, we realize you're busy. This is a compressed schedule, as we reported today. Not like that's news. Uh, in order to get through as many questions as possible, we are asking each candidate to try to limit their answers to less than three minutes. I will be a nominal timekeeper, but I think that that's fair. This will allow us to hit on major topics of concern and be respectful of your time. For the end of our time, the editorial board has prepared several questions for each candidate specifically, and these are based on things within your own campaign. Um, the first uh, round of questions will be general, each same question to each one of you. Uh, the questions have been formulated by the Billings Gazette editorial board, which consists of publisher Mike Gulledge, general manager Dave Worstel, opinion page editor Pat Bellinghausen, and community member uh, Kathy Grott. Uh, I am Daryl Ehrlich. I am the editor of the Gazette, and once again, welcome. The clicking you hear in the background is because not only are we digital, but we're still print, and uh, Larry Mayer is here, and uh, he dressed up for you. He's in a tie today, uh, and <laughs> Thanks, he'll be Larry. taking photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Larry. So, be without much ado, we will begin. And um, uh, uh, Mike, you you have the first question. And thank you, Greg and Rob, for being here and being a part of the political process. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. First question: Public lands <clears throat> and a debate about whether they should be transferred to state control is a big issue in the West. What is your position? Why don't we start with you, Greg? Great. First, I want to thank the editorial yes. board. Uh, this is the first time Rob and I have had a chance to sit down together and discuss the issues. So I think this is a milestone event, and thank you for the Gazette for putting this together. Great. So, uh, you, very clear. Public lands have to stay in public hands. We should not be transferring deeds to the state. Um, I'm in Montana in large part because of our public lands. I came here first in 1976. I've told you the story before. <clears throat> Raised our kids in the backcountry, uh, whether it's at Sorky Beartooth Wilderness, the Lee Metcalf, or the Bob, wherever it happens to be. Uh, we, uh, so that, I mean, there's not a lot to discuss there. Mm -hmm. It's part of our way of life. Public lands have to stay in public hands. Okay, thank you. Well, you know, um, I grew up in a, on a ranch farming community in North Glacier County. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the front range of the Rocky Mountains is the backdrop for my for my childhood. And just in a matter of minutes, that you could disappear into uh, into what is one of the most beautiful landscapes in uh, Montana in the world, really. And so, of course, this has always been a passion of mine. I learned to love my I learned to have my love for the wild open spaces, you know, in this time frame. And to me, this is the defining issue of this race. You know, um, of course. It, it, Throughout my whole career, you can hear that I've been standing up for our wild lands, you know, through my music. That's been a subject of almost every song I've ever written about the Big Sky Country. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, to me, this is the, one of the most defining issues of this race. And uh, I, I really feel that, that I can really delineate because there's a difference between my stand on public lands and that of my opponent. I mean, he, I think that he's, he's actually funded groups whose main goal it is to take public lands. I've traveled all over this country, and um, I realize that many states have lost what we still have in Montana. And I think that Montanans realize that this is a big issue with them as well. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I think that you know we, we can we can talk about we can actions speak louder than words. And I think that the fact that he is funding groups whose sole goal it is is to transfer public lands into private hands, I think that's a real problem. And I think the people of Montana will agree with me. On that. Mr. Quist, if I may ask a follow up, what uh, what Groups is Mr. Gianforte funding that are that seek to take public lands out of out of his, out of out of public hands. I think it's there's the Perk uh, Foundation. There's also the Heritage Foundation, and also Americans for Prosperity. I think these are <clears throat> these are organizations that I think are, are you know, I, and also I think that he's also campaigned with uh, with Rick Perry, who's who has advocated for transferring public lands into private hands. You know, so so I think that's you know it's it's. 
it's kind of like that old adage, you know, by their actions, you shall know them. And, <clears throat> and so I think that, you know, it's, that's, that's what speaks loud to me. Okay. Mr. Gianforte, you, you said before, and I've heard you say it, it's catchy public lands and public hands. But you've also said that, uh, that bureaucrats in Washington shouldn't be controlling Montana's public lands or do not uh, understand them. Help me understand for you, too, what, the, uh, what is the role of management of those public lands? Uh, uh, if you're, is it federal? Is it state? What is it? Yeah, so um, the uh, forest management is not working today. I mean, if you look at our national forests, we burn our forests every summer. Mm -hmm. And if we actually had better management, we'd have healthier forests, there'd be more wildlife, there'd be more hunting opportunities for Montanans. We'd also continue to have timber going to our mills, and we'd have less forest fire. So forest management is a win-win, a, you know, win-win-win, kind of across the board. Uh, what I am advocating for is more mechanisms like what we have in the Farm Bill that allow for collaborative agreements. So to be really clear, I do not support deed transfer of lands. I've been unequivocal on this. Uh, Mr. Quist is just confused on this issue. Um, so that Montanans can have more say. I think better decisions get made when they're made locally. Um, the, uh, uh, so that, that's, that's the management I'm looking for. Uh, I, it, we, uh, we, we've seen a lot of wildlife head down onto private land. It's not available on public land anymore. And, and honestly, we saw a big step forward here today with the Trump administration calling for uh, a tariff on soft timber coming out of Canada. As I've met with the timber industry here in Montana, um, you know, the, these foreign trade deals are extremely important. And uh, we need to manage our natural resources and protect the environment. Uh, and, and we need to look at both sides of this. Great. Kathy, I believe the next question is yours. Okay, let's switch from uh, public lands to uh, Russia, the Russians. Um, as a member of Congress, will either one of you push for the authorization of an independent investigation of collusion between the Russians and President Trump's administration? And we'll start with you, Rob. You know, I, I really feel that, that uh, you know, we have to have an, an, an a, uh, independent investigation on this. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, you know, we, uh, when, you, when there's an investigation going on, you cannot have uh, people who have an agenda, you know, to protect, you know, to, to be involved in this. You know, this is something I think that, uh, you know, we need to have transparency in government. And I think it, it goes a long way when we have an independent investigation toward that transparency. So uh, if there is collusion, you know, the, the American people need to know. Right. Thank you. And I mean, obviously we need, we need transparency. I think if there is uh, evidence that shows there's some intervention, we ought to look at it. And uh, Congress ought to pursue it. I think I've been a big advocate of transparency. Uh, that's why I've released... 10 years of my tax returns, actually now 11 years. And uh, I, I believe in transparency. So are you satisfied, uh, Mr. Gianforte, follow-up question, are you satisfied with the, uh, with the oversight that's been done thus far up into, uh, as, as Congress has investigated claims of collusion between uh, Russia and the Trump administration? Well, I, I, I haven't been in every hearing. Sure. Uh, I, don't, I don't know all the specific details. Uh, I do think that uh, we've got a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uncivil behavior in our society today, uh, kind of across the board. We see a lot of conflict in Washington, and this is what has voters in Montana so kind of upset. What I've done in my whole career uh, is brought people together. You know, in business, you end up working with a lot of different people. <clears throat> and honestly, people think the technology industry is kind of about uh, technology, and it is at some level, but we ended up doing a thousand negotiations a quarter in our business uh, with all kinds of tough customers. And, you know, I haven't been married 29 years, and many of you, you know, uh, two people don't always agree on everything. But I think if you start with the principle involved in a problem, like transparency or uh, America's national defense or making sure we have education so every child can reach their full potential, it's a lot easier to find the common ground uh, with the people involved. This is, as an example of this, I just... I point to recently, I've been getting a lot, I'm a, I'm a pro natural resource development guy. I think we should do developing our natural resources. I think we can reconcile that with uh, protecting the environment as well. We can do both. And I've gotten a lot of input from the, the people over in uh, Paradise Valley about this immigrant in Crevice Mine. 
Uh, I went and I met with uh, local legislators, Democrat and Republican county commissioners, business owners, this Yellowstone uh, Business Coalition, and concluded that this was not the right base for mine. So I, I just, by that, I'm trying to demonstrate that I bring to these issues not a particular ideology, but a set of problem-solving skills that I acquired being trained as an engineer, and I'd approach similar problems back in D.C. Great. Pat, I believe your question, you have a question. Um, I have a, a multi-part question on health care. Um, that's great to answer first. When the Montana legislature and the governor enacted um, the Medicaid expansion under um, the Affordable Care Act, it included a provision that the federal government would have to maintain paying 90% of the costs of the, of the Medicaid expansion or else the Montana program would be discontinued. My first part of the question is, do you, will you support maintaining the federal government's match at at least 90% so that the Montana program will continue? And also I wanted to ask you specifically if you would support uh, access to uh, contraceptives and maternity care, and if you think those health care services should be covered by, be required to be covered by insurance. Yeah, okay. So um, I think we have to face the fact first that Obamacare is in a death spiral. Um, the Medicaid expansion that occurred in Montana has added 70,000 more people onto coverage. Uh, and let me be really clear, we cannot rip the carpet out from underneath these people. I, I believe one of, if you look at the four purposes of the federal government, one of them is to provide a social safety net for people that can't take care of themselves. So we can't rip the carpet out there. In the same <clears throat> breath, though, I'll also say I have concerns about the long-term costs of these programs um, and how they get paid for. Um, this is not a solved problem. This is why I do support repealing and replacing Obamacare. Um, I did not support the House initial proposal that came out because, for me, there were, there were two issues. One was uh, it didn't actually uh, reduce premiums for Montanans, and it didn't preserve rural access. And that's, those are the lit litmus tests for me in looking at any repeal and replace proposal. Um, but I also think Obamacare, in certain ways, didn't go far enough. It, it didn't deal with some of the underlying costs of health care. It didn't deal with prescription drug costs. It didn't deal with... Uh, the high cost of malpractice insurance that drives up the delivery of health care. Uh, so these are things we need to look at. Um, I think that in the case of specific benefit items, um, it's, I think we need more options. Uh, one of the problems with Obamacare was that it was essentially a one-size-fits-all program mandating certain levels of coverage, and as a consequence, the cost for everyone went up. Uh, I think that if consumers have cho more choices, that we don't force everybody to a one-size-fits-all, uh, people can acquire the um, services they want and pay for the services they want. Thank you. <clears throat> Rob? You know, uh, for uh, Mr. Gianforte to talk about the uh, Obamacare being in a death spiral, I think as a businessman, I think that you know that 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 is really not true. I think that what has been in the death spiral is the AHCA because you know, this would raise premiums on uh, average month, <clears throat> average people, three hundred dollars a month, and uh, of course, it would be a, a much higher cost for uh, for uh, seniors. You know, for people between fifty and sixty years of age, and they would be paying you know five to six times as much as younger people, and it would give special tax breaks to <clears throat> to the millionaires, and also uh, special tax breaks to ex insurance company executives. You know, to me. Um, well, I agree that one of the things that we need to cut is is prescription drug costs, and I think that it's it's interesting that that, that Mr. Gene Forty has two and a half million dollars in stocks in some of these pharmaceutical co uh, companies that are actually gouging the the people of America on some some of these high drug prices. <clears throat> I have a personal story on that. My wife is is allergic to bee stings, and we almost lost her about three years ago. And for her to carry this EpiPen, it's it's five hundred dollars for this EpiPen. She can get the same EpiPen in Canada from her relatives for twenty dollars. So I mean, this is this is an, an just a, a an idea of how out of whack our our pharmaceutical drugs are, you know. And um, there's also you know, as far as Medicare goes, you um, the people on Medicare cannot cannot barter for for uh, pharmaceutical prices. You know, that's something that we need to allow so we can have 
<clears throat> you know, have a lot uh, less cost for pharmaceutical drugs, and we need to have reimportation from Canada so we can have more uh, effective, you know, low costs on pharmaceutical drugs. Mr. Quist, I'd uh, like a. Can I just sure. follow up? Neither one of you answered my question about uh, contraceptive coverage and maternity care. Well, I will answer that. You know, the thing is that I, I support access to birth control, I support. Uh, I support preventative screenings, you know, and I think that the assault that uh, of uh, of on women's health care is is something that we all need to resist. And I'm happy to be clear. I thought I did answer it, but um, as I, I think that different services are required by different people, and if someone wants those services, I have no problem them being in an insurance package. But a consumer should be able to decide whether they want those services or not. Mr. Gianforte, doesn't that defeat the purpose of insurance? I mean, insurance is to spread risk. If I can pick and choose which services I want, uh, I'm not really buying insurance. I'm, I'm, I, it's not, it's, isn't that destined to fail? I mean, the idea is to get large groups of people together to lower your risk. So I don't understand how that works and that, that's how, how that would not end up in a death spiral. Well, um, it does work because this is more of what we had before. Um, in our own business, we, I feel it's an, op, an employer's obligation to provide health care to the employees. We, we spend over $5 million a year providing health care to our employees. Um, uh, but if there are groups of people that uh, uh, choose to band together to purchase insurance in a certain way, and an a insurance vendor chooses to offer a package of services and it matches their requirements, I think choice is what allows a free market to work, and it would actually bring costs down. Well, to me, I think that, you know, to me, the wrong people are sitting at the table making our health care decisions. You know, we should have the people of, of the, this country having representatives, you know, instead of, uh, instead of the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies making our health care decisions. For well, me. Rob, I agree with you on that. And, uh, uh, but going to a 100% government-run health care program. Uh, is a step in the wrong direction. Well, you know, I, I've, uh, I've been clear about that. Let, let, let me ask you, let, let, I don't want to derail this. I've got uh, follow-up questions for each of you. Mr. Quist, do you believe there are problems with Obamacare as, as it currently stands? You know, I think there are. And I think, but each, t you know, of course... What are, when, what are they? Well, I think one of the main problems, as I said before, is the high cost of pharmaceutical drugs. You know, in fact, uh, you know, the, the fact that, uh, that he has all this stock in companies that, that are... I think another problem is uh, that there needs to be more tr price transparency uh, for he med medical uh, health care providers. You know, for, I think if they were able to, uh, to post you know, how much it was cost for in, in each individual um, you know, procedures, I think that would go a long ways. Also, I think there's a big problem with the coding system that we have, too. This is almost a, a language that nobody really understands, and I think that there's a lot of room for, for charging people, overcharging people for prices of what they have for their health care. Mr. Gianforte, you talk about what, what the, wrong, the wrong thing is, I, I, and I listened to an interview you did, I believe it was two weeks ago, and, and they talked about, you talked at length at health care. I'm curious, how do you walk away from the fact that outcomes in first world countries, most of whom have a universal health care, that the life expectancy is longer and the cost is lower? I mean, you're a business guy, that to me would be return on investment and, and value. How do you walk away uh, that America seems to be stuck on the fact that it will not go here, and yet the data from other countries, including the World Health Organization, seem to, to suggest that, that you get better value and better outcome? Well, I, I, I agree with you. What we're doing here in the U.S. is not working. Right. Uh, we, we now spend 20% of our GDP on health care, and we're getting lower outcomes than, as you mentioned, other uh, developed nations in Western Europe and other places. Um, but going to a monopoly system, I, I, it's hard to point to uh, uh, another uh, uh, scenario where a complete government-run health care program has actually been, uh, excuse me, government-run program is ever more efficient or gives consumers the choices they want. Uh, the, uh, we, we found that in our business, and I think it, uh, choice produces a better result. I, you know, uh, with Rob, I agree on the fact that prescription drugs have to be dealt with. Uh, they're out of control. I think if we're going to grant a company a patent on a particular innovation, uh, when you issue a monopoly, it's not unreasonable to put some controls and some sidebars on that so the consumers don't get gouged. That's I agree with them on the prescription drug. I think, though, that the path should be towards more choice for consumers, not less choice for consumers. And that's where we deviate.
Well, you know, I think it, <clears throat> to, to say that, uh, that government-run programs, I think Medicare is probably one of the most successful programs that's ever been instituted in, in, our, in our country in terms of health care. You know, and uh, that's, that's just a great, a great system. You walk in, you show your card, you're covered, no questions asked. You know, so to me, Medicare has just been a, a great system. And quite frankly, it helped me get through a pretty rough period in my life when we were facing some health care issues. And I was able to take Social Security and, uh, and get Medicare, and that really got me and my family through probably one of the toughest periods of our lives. Yes. However, so Mr. Mr. Quist, I, I appreciate that point, and, I, uh, and I'm glad you're here, uh, and I'm glad your family's here. But uh, if you talk to medical providers, a huge part of Billings' economy and sector, we have, they will tell you that Medicare reimbursement rates are low, and if they, if, if they had to make it off that, they'd have to shutter. So Medicare is great for a person who has a card, but may not be great for the provider. And there is no, uh, there is no incentive for outcomes. There is just simply payment for procedures. How can you say it's one of the greatest programs when both of those things are true? Well, I think, you know, the, first of all, we, we, that's why we need to defend the ACA. You know, it's, uh, this is a, a program that we need to strengthen <clears throat> to carry forward. And, you know, I, I really feel that... Uh, you know that that our health care is is such an important thing. I've met with the uh, with the Montana Hospital Association, <clears throat> and uh, they are very concerned that that all these cuts that are happening you know to uh, to Medicare and is going to really fully impact you know our rural communities. You know, so Montana is a rural state. You know, we have a uh, you know, we we cannot have a program that cuts medical costs. You know, so that people have to travel hours. You know, to get to uh, to a medical facility for their health care. Right. Dave, I believe uh, we're going to switch topics. We could talk about health care probably for a lot longer. It's than, top of mind for a lot of voters. Yep, it is. Yeah, it sure is. Good. we got another one for we you. We do. Yeah, let's talk about the, the federal budget a little bit. Um, and Mr. Rob, if you can start with uh, your response first. Uh, President, Trump, President Trump's budget plan includes a 20% a reduction for the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, do you support cutting the USDA? And how would you ensure that the cuts don't adversely affect Montana's number one industry? Well, I come from a ranching and farming <clears throat> community. You know, I, for the first 18 years of my life, you know, I, I was, uh, of course, we lived on a ranch and a farm. And, you know, right now, um, you know, these, I think any cuts that, that happen to, to, uh, to our, our farmers and ranchers is going to be devastating. You know, my family still farms up in the North Glacier County. Last year, they had one of the best years that they've ever had, but due to the lack of, uh, of, of poor trade agreements, you know, they, they were not able to capitalize on, on the fact that they had one of the best years ever because the price of grain is so low. We have um, our farmers produce, you know, uh, some of the best grains in the world, and 80% uh, and of the grain that they, they produce is, is shipped overseas. We have to have strong trade agreements that, that, uh, that help them get their, their uh, product out to other countries, as well as the stock growers as well. You know, so I think any cuts you know, to, uh, to uh, these families and these farm families is going to be devastating. Yeah, so, I, I mean, as we all know, ag is our number one industry here in the state. Uh, my mother's family were dairy farmers, and I grew up around the farm uh, when I was young. Um, and uh, uh, we have a farm bill that's expiring here in 2018. We need to get started now. In making sure we have a, a reasonable bill there, uh, the 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 challenge we have the best way to help farmers. Uh, so uh, I want to answer your question about the cuts. Um, <clears throat> we have a twenty trillion dollar budget. I've spent my whole life balancing budgets. That's what I've done in business, uh, and you make uh, decisions. I think that I what I am representing to the people of Montana is I will always be on Montana's side as we make these decisions. I don't agree with all the cuts that are in the Trump budget. Uh, but we need to bring fiscal discipline to, wa to Washington. Uh, we need to get a farm bill passed that uh, supports our agricultural community. Um, the, uh, but it's also the best way we can help farmers and ranchers is make sure we have good trade deals with foreign powers. I'm thrilled that we're making progress towards getting beef into China. Uh, we need to do more of that. Uh, but I will say on the budget in particular, it's not, although the, the president puts forward uh, a, a trial budget. It's the House that controls the purse strings. And what I promised to Montana is I will take uh, Montana's interest back there and make sure we get a, a budget that actually uh, supports Montana. And uh, Mr. Quist, on that, 
you said that you support uh, fair trade deals and, and ways to get. Um, so, do you support continuing uh, to to push for things like the trade partnerships, the TPP, things like that, or are you do you would you side more out with the, the 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 current administration on trying to to change these deals because they haven't made sense? For <clears throat> well, I you? think. First of all, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is, hasn't been implemented. This, this is kind of dead in the water. So I think that we are, we are at this time, we are going to have to, to, uh, to promote uh, bilateral trade agreements. You know, I think that uh, it's interesting that he says he's on Montana's side when, you know, I've been out in this campaign meeting with farmers and ranchers, you know, meeting with people face to face where, while he's been going to Washington, D.C., meeting with some of these special interest groups, you know, that are not necessarily working in the, in the uh, interests, you know, of, of our farmers and ranchers, you know, so. This is really interesting to learn about. Where, where do you make this stuff up? Yeah, you, you know, you were at the, uh, at this, uh, the conclave with, with Donald Trump. Do you deny that you were there for that? In, in Washington, D.C.? I, I was in Washington, D.C. once yeah. in this campaign. Well, I know. And I met with the grain growers last I week. I met with the stock <coughs> growers. And I've driven 76,000 miles all over this state. That was last year, Greg. I no, mean, that this, was this year yeah. and last year. No, last year, last year, this, that was the election for the, for the government. This is the U.S. House of Representatives. You know, and, and I've been out, I've been in uh, 50 counties here in the last three months meeting with people face to face, having town hall meetings, you know. So, you know, I think that how you run this job, how you run this election is how you're going to, to be running the job. You know, that's, you, you need to be a representative my, of the people of Montana. And that's, that's how you're going to in this office. This isn't the Millionaire's Club. Right. This is the House of Representatives. Mr. Gianforte, you've been, let's talk a little bit about where you've been. The, the press I've seen, Montana Public Radio says you haven't been out as much as you were during the governor's race. Have you been back in Washington, D.C. meeting with all these special interest groups? Where, where, where have you been? Um, let's just hit. I've been, I'm, I'm up, I, I finished the last race at uh, uh, just about 60,000 miles driven. I was in every county. I stayed in people's homes through that whole period. I've been doing the same in this race. I'm out every day. Uh, we had a great series of events. We had over almost 2,500 <clears throat> people in our rallies over here over the weekend. And I was encouraged. Uh, and and uh, uh, I've been out doing the same thing. I, th there's a tendency on the other side to create some false narrative. We've seen it in the past. And, you know, the reality is the fact that I have been in every county multiple times, uh, stayed in people's homes, met with the farmers and ranchers, met with the manufacturing folks, met with the students on campuses and been in all these things, gives me a very good handle on what the issues are in this race. And uh, I'll take the fact that uh, um, I've gained that experience over this period of time. And honestly, it's just recommitted myself to be a strong voice for Montana back in DC. Okay. Well, I think it's interesting I, that, that people- We're gonna move on. Okay. We're gonna move on. Uh, we're going to talk about something else that I'm sure is near and dear to Montanans' guns. Mr. Gianforte, this will be your question first. Mr. Quist, <clears throat> you've, previous, but you've previously talked about registering guns and comparing it to, to vehicle registrations. Mr. Gianforte, you've stood against background checks and gun laws saying the Second Amendment guarantees the right uh, for citizens to carry. Uh, you have opposed a background check, uh, a universal background check that would may indicate if a person is mentally unfit. And so my question to both of you is, what role does the government have in regulating who may carry guns and where they may be carried? Mr. Gianforte, you... So, um, I, I mean, this is a really <clears throat> clear point of distinction between myself and my partner. I have been a life member of the NRA. Um, I have an A rating from the NRA. Uh, my opponent uh, has an F rating, um, has advocated for a gun registry. I, I believe if you look back at history, registration of guns uh, is a first step towards confiscation of guns, and that's not a Montana value. Um, so I, I believe that there are um, uh, circumstances where uh, public safety can trump uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the carrying of a gun. I, I take, for example, I mean, I believe strongly in our First Amendment as well as our Second Amendment. The First Amendment says freedom of speech. But no one would advocate for somebody going to a crowded movie theater and shouting uh, uh, fire because uh, that would cause a public safety issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, clearly alcohol and, and guns don't mix. Someone mm -hmm. who's committed a crime and been convicted of a felony should, should lose their rights to firearms, especially if it was a violent offense. So I think we need to bring common sense and reason to it. But I go back to the Second Amendment 
and it says very clearly, the right to own and bear arms shall not be infringed. And for me, the Constitution <clears throat> is a guiding light. I think when we, we swear our oath of office, we look at that, that Constitution. We swear to the Constitution. Right, but you just said that, the, uh, that, that there's a balancing of these rights. Um, are you suggesting that the Second Amendment is absolute? Um, the, the, uh, I believe the Second Amendment is very clear. It says our right to own and bear arms shall not be infringed. Right, for, uh, for the purpose of a militia, right? And for personal protection. Does it say personal protection? It says it, it, it is, there is no qualifier on it. Okay, what is that, so what is that scenario? You said people who may have been, uh, had owned a gun in, <clears throat> in personal, uh, who have committed a violent crime. What, what's the mechanism to make sure that those people who maybe shouldn't have a gun don't if you don't favor a universal background check? How, how are we to well, do that yeah, practically? And, that, and that's the challenge because in our society, um, the, we put supposedly well-meaning rules in place, and what they end up doing is impacting law-abiding citizens more than they impact the, indiv the individual. Because if, if the question was, could someone who is mentally unstable, and I agree that we need to do more in mental health to kind of deal with the situation. But as um, uh, if someone is mentally unstable and they want to <clears throat> cause harm to other people, a firearm is one way to do it. A car is another. A truck. I mean, so where do these rules and restrictions on law-abiding citizens end? It, th this is the challenge I think you get into as you, it becomes a sticky wicket as you look at it. Sure. I'm just curious because I'm trying to figure out where, what you would do to make sure that those, those guns stay out of the, the hands, but I don't hear anything specific from you. My concern with rest restrictions on the purchasing and acquiring of firearms is that it has greater impact on law-abiding citizens than it does on um, the individuals who are trying to target there. We need to look at other mechanisms to do that it's instead of mechanisms that impact all citizens. Okay. Mr. Quist, you've talked about uh, a gun registry. You, I wanna, I'd like to hear where you think the government uh, should be regulating, um, and, and do they have, does the government have, need to regulate who may carry a gun and where they may do it? Well, first of all, you know, uh, we were talking about fully automatic um, assault rifles, and they are already required you know, to be um, registered, if, uh, if you understand this. And, you know, I come from a ranching and farming community, and you know, um, gun safety was, was part of my upbringing. And for him to suggest otherwise that, that I'm not strong on, on Second Amendment rights is patently false. Um, you know, I've got guns that are much older than the number of years that he's been in the state. And, you know, uh, quite frankly, you know, I've got the support of the Montana Sportsman's Alliance and also the Hunters and Anglers. So, so they understand that, <clears throat> that uh, where I stand on this. And I think that they, they know that, that it is really the loss to access to public lands is the number one reason that people no longer will hunt. You know? so, so I think that uh, once again, uh, talking about, <clears throat> about spreading false information, I think that this is, this is something that, that he needs to address. I also think that he needs to address the fact that uh, Oracle, which is a company that he has had a, a really strong relationship with, is, is actually promoting a gun registry. They are the ones that have been collecting data on the citizens of America you know, throughout, <clears throat> throughout since 9-11. And this is a company that he has uh, sold his company to, and uh, they've, they've had, a, he's had, he reports to have a real close relationship with this, with this company that is collecting data, you know, for, for a gun registry. So I think you need to answer but, that. But, uh, no, okay, well, I, I get that, but I don't understand, help me understand, what, what does a company that he sold to and that he hasn't had a business relationship, how is that on him if, if what they're doing? I, I don't understand how Mr. G and Forte has control over Oracle. Well, he says that he has, you know, first of all, he sold his company to it, and he says that he still maintains close relationship with it. This is a data collecting organization, sure. you know, and, and uh, they are purpose. collecting they are collecting data on, on gun owners. You know, so for him to, to accuse me of uh, wanting a gun registry, I think it's... Uh, so you don't business. want a gun registry? No, I, I, what I meant by at that time is that, uh, you know, fully automatic uh, assault rifles are required to be gun registered now. I think that the the, uh, the 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 laws that we have for the state of Montana are are appropriate for this state. Okay, Mr. Gianforte, I've got a question, follow-up question for you. You said that confiscation of guns is the first step toward toward tyranny. Uh, what what where do you 
what evidence of if, if there are uh, our registration <coughs> is the first step excuse me towards towards confiscation which I imagine would lead to tyranny what evidence <coughs> do you have that that even if we have a registry that it's going to lead to confiscation that sounds like kind of tin hat tinfoil hat kind of things that if if the government I mean is the government gonna seize my car because it, it's registered um, it's important that our Second Amendment rights are defended and having every Montanans name in a database back in Washington DC um, uh, with a list of firearms is just is, 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 is not consistent with the intent of our founding fathers and I'll defend individual Montanans right to uh, keep and bear arms. Okay, well, but going along that line, you, you collected data, uh, you were in a software company. The government, I believe, and I don't know what the government has on me, maybe I should, maybe I should check on that someday. I don't know what the government <laughs> has on me, but I bet the government has a lot of information about me. What makes whether I own a gun so much different? I mean, I may have a lot of money, I may or, or not, or I may have knives or may not. Mm -hmm. what, what makes well, that Well, you know, I, I, I saw this in Australia. I mean, to give you a specific example. Um, we had a, uh, a friend, sheep, uh, sheep station west of uh, Sydney. Um, they, uh, they run a, a, a big spread. Um, they, they try and protect their sheep, particularly from a bird that's like a magpie, <clears throat> um, that uh, comes in and pecks the eyes out of the lambs, and it uh, causes loss in their herd. Um, they had to register their guns. And, um, the, they had to keep the guns in one building, and ammunition had to be locked in a separate building on the ranch. Um, the, uh, and then inspectors would show up periodically. Uh, the database got posted online, um, and all of a sudden they were in a remote rural area. Uh, they became a target for criminals to come and st attempt to steal the guns. And they ended up um, concluding that the burdens that got placed on gun ownership in Australia were so high that they didn't want to they didn't want to maintain them anymore. So they ended up relinquishing them, and now they watch uh, livestock losses every spring because they can't defend their personal property. They can't keep the guns, uh, and the registry there in Australia actually made them a target for criminals. So that's a specific scenario, a specific example where a registry has resulted in the wrong result. Okay. Mike, I think you're next. Another amendment-related question, and this is for you, uh, Mr. Quiz, first. And what should the role of the press be in covering government elections and elected officials? Well, you know, I think that uh, I think really a lot of ways that our our press has, uh, you know, really lost its ability in many ways in in uh, to uh, to to present us with uh, with fair and balanced reporting. I mean, it seems like now there's uh, alternative news facts have been introduced, you know, to where it's becoming an agenda for a lot of news sites, you know, to uh, you know to report what their what their agenda is. You know, when I <clears throat> and whenever I uh, hear uh, news, I think the first piece, thing that people have to ask themselves is to consider the source. You know, to look beyond the news and you know what is the agenda behind the people that are speaking. I think that's really important for for Americans to understand. And quite frankly, that's also um, a good way for us to understand our politics as well. And so I think that, you know, it's it's really, um, I understand that there are many news services that are, are really um, diligent in, in finding the truth. And I think that, you know, that we need to really encourage those types of news sites and uh, and make that uh, really a prominent thing in, in our news service today. Great. So um, clearly freedom of press is, mm -hmm. uh, delineated in our First Amendment, mm -hmm. um, along with freedom of religion, right to assembly. And and I think it's critically important. There's a yin and a yang, and you and I have had these discussions in, yes. in private and, and sometimes in public. And uh, I think it's a healthy thing in our society. And I, I'll, I'll admit, you know, at times I've been frustrated, but I think it's a, a good system because it there is an accountability there on both ways. And it's the reason it's, it's, it's part of our free society that I think the press, when there are, and I'll agree with Mr. Quist on this, when there are facts uh, that can be substantiated, then uh, public officials should be held accountable. Thank you. Pat, or Kathy, excuse Kathy. me. Sorry, can't read my own notes. Okay, let's move on to uh, climate change. 
Um, what role does human activity play in climate change, and what should or shouldn't the federal government uh, be doing about climate change? <clears throat> Greg, you can start on that one. Okay. Well, uh, first let me say the climate is changing. Uh, and as a scientist myself, I'm trained as an electrical engineer, um, I know that you can't have any equation uh, that has inputs that don't affect the output. So if the question is, is man having some impact on climate change, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I think one of the problems, however, as we study this, is that sometimes I think the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. And let me take something that's near and dear to our hearts, which is fossil fuels and coal in particular, which is the the other side of the climate change discussion. Um, you know, using the EPA's own data, uh, which was uh, crunched by the Cato Institute, um, the conclusion was from that data was that if every coal-fired plant in North America was shut down, the in in a hundred years from now, the environment would be two hundredths of a degree cooler. Uh, and the margin of error on that study was four hundredths of a degree. So we can say we want to pursue less climate change that's impacted by CO2 from coal, but in the process of doing that here in Montana, uh, the trade-off would be 7,000 high-wage jobs in coal strip and elsewhere around the state, and one and a half billion dollar negative impact to our economy. It would be, according to the University of Montana, the single largest catastrophic event in the in the, in, in the last 30 years in Montana. So yes, there's climate change. Yes, man has some impact on it. I think we need to, in any situation, we've got to make sure we get the facts, use common sense, and arrive at a conclusion that's going to be the right thing for Montana. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Quist? Well, you know, the thing is, you know, we have to realize that, that it's an accumulative thing. It's not just one coal plant. It's an accumulation that, <clears throat> that really is driving climate change in this world. And I think Montana has a, a great opportunity to get out in front of this with, with our uh, opportunities for renewable energies. Uh, at the same time, we have to realize that coal is a big economic driver in the state. And, um, you know, and I think it's important that we make sure that, uh, that uh, the units three and four stay in operation because in order to do that, you know, they have to pay for the cleanup of what's happening. I was just in Coal Strip here just the other day, you know, meeting with workers who, who are on that. And I got to tour uh, the reclamation projects. And it was, it was pretty impressive how they're reclaiming the ground down there. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's, uh, it's, I think that we have to have a, an energy policy that is, is created by Montanans for Montanans. But at the same time, you know, Montana has a great opportunity, you know, to, to create new, renewable energies and to create jobs and reduce our carbon footprint, which I think is really vital for us moving forward into the coming years. How do you do that, Mr. Quist, when uh, that kind of infrastructure requires large amounts of capital and it may require subsidies for an energy that, that cannot compete against other traditional markets? Well, I think that it really can compete because I think it, even now, you know, solar and wind is actually cheaper to produce, you know, in, with all um, with a lot of our uh, fossil fuel technologies, but at the same time, you know, this is this is going to be have to be a gradual transition. You know, this is something that we can't we cannot pull the rug out from from uh, our our families that make you know money <clears throat> make their living you know through through the coal industry. And you know, as I said, to our state budget is really predicated on uh, our our coal industry. So I think one of the reasons that uh, <clears throat> that our our budget has been in trouble is because uh, the coal market is is drying up in China. And I think that also they're not really allowing coal through uh, as much uh, through Washington, through the ports as well. So, so I think we just have to recognize that we have to be, get out in front of this and, you know, and, and come up with a, con a comprehensive plan you know, for the future of Montana. Mr. Gianforte, isn't the idea, so let's just take the, pre the, the notion that, that uh, climate change doesn't change or change is negligible to uh, two tenths of a degree? Two hundredths of a degree. degree. Couldn't the same argument been be made that that hey at least it, you're holding the line on climate change it's not it, it may not get it much worse isn't that the point of climate change that not that we want to or can't even completely reverse it but that we make some progress wouldn't that argue for coals dropping coal rather than burning more well I think we need a level playing field in energy I mean I think energy production in the U.S. is not only an economic issue, it's also a national defense issue. We've been beholden to sources of uh, 
fossil fuels in the Middle East, it's a very unstable, and honestly, many of those people aren't our friends. I think, you know, I go back to my core reasons for the federal government. Number one is national defense, followed by make and enforce laws, infrastructure we can't pay for in any other way, and this social safety net for people. I am fully convinced that if we apply American ingenuity to coal, we can burn it cleanly. Um, unfortunately, the policy we've had is massive subsidies for solar and wind and a regulatory war on coal. That's not a level playing field. Uh, we also have not been able to get, uh, I, you know, this is one point that, uh, in fact, in speaking with various people in the coal industry, and I've been to coal strip many times myself, um, and, and particularly uh, with uh, the, uh, the reserves we have in the state, we need to be pushing to get a port on the West Coast opened up so we can get our low sulfur coal to more markets in Asia. They want to buy our coal. We don't have the capacity on the West Coast. So I think it's a combination of American ingenuity applied to coal, um, a level playing field so that coal has to compete along with uh, renewables, and uh, opening up more foreign markets for it. And let's, let the, let's, let's burn it cleanly uh, and use the best economic solution. Can you we know, burn it? Uh, question. Can we burn it cleanly? I mean, we've talked about clean coal for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I remember growing up in Montana and they were talking about clean coal. How do you make, how do you do that when A, it hasn't really been done and the cost, or the cost is so prohibitive that mining coal doesn't make sense? You're for, you said you're for a free market, but the free market would, would seem to argue against clean coal because of the cost. Yeah, the biggest issue we have in coal today, in addition to the regulatory burden, and I was pleased to see the, the, the withdrawal of the clean power plan, which is, was just um, uh, a really a persecution of the coal industry, is that uh, um, natural gas prices are so low. I mean, uh, we, we thought we were going to run out of oil and gas by the end of last uh, decade. And <clears throat> Lo and behold, we got, we got a new method of extraction and natural gas prices have come way down. Um, economically, the best thing that could hold, help coal in Montana would be an increase in natural gas prices. Now, I'm not advocating for increased prices. It's just what the market is. Uh, but uh, uh, a reliable, low-cost energy source for our country is both an economic driver for our economy and it's important for a national, national national defense. And I think we ought to be pursuing all of the above. Okay, Pat, I believe you have the next question. Well, I'm gonna <coughs> skip back to a, a question that didn't get asked earlier. Um, if, if elected, would you? how would you work across the aisle with House members from the other party? And uh, two, I like two part questions. If elected, will you commit to having in-person, face-to-face town hall meetings here in Montana? Uh, <coughs> I, Rob, 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 yeah, I, would, I would love to answer that one. Um, you know, first of all, I really feel like that's been a skill of mine, you know, for, um, I always feel that, that the way that you work with people is by making personal connections, which is what I've done, you know, throughout this whole campaign. You know, I've been meeting with Republican groups, you know, and, and uh, I've also been meeting with Republican legislators. And, Every group I've been in, it's, it's been a special skill of mine that I've always been the mediator of any group I've been in. And, you know, I really feel like I have an ability to get people to suspend their need to be right and to suspend their ego, to work on problems that need to be solved, you know, at, that, and at, at the particular problem that you're working on. And, uh, of course, you know, I think, um, you know, working across the aisle is, is something that I will definitely do, you know, uh, when, when I get to Congress. And what was the second part of your question, Pat? If you're elected, will you commit to having a face-to-face, oh, yeah. in-person town hall Absolutely. in Montana? Absolutely. I mean, and that's that's how you run this office, you know. And that's what I've done throughout this whole campaign, is meeting with the people on a face-to-face -face basis, you know. And I re <clears throat> uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Gianforti has been charging people you know, admi to a uh, $35 admission ticket to get into Solano Buddy's fence, that should not have to be the case. People in Montana really need to have access to their, their representatives, you know. So, so and I've been, um, you know, meeting with whoever wants to me I've got an open door policy and I have an organizational chart that you know that uh, instead of having the the uh, CEO at the top I flipped that upside down so that the people of Montana are uh, the boss and then my staff is uh, next and I'm at the bottom of that so I plan to be the a servant of the people of Montana Mr. Gene Forte same question Great. well um, first off absolutely I'll be out 
meeting with individuals, having town hall meetings. I, I've been in every county in the state multiple times here in the last 18 months, um, and I would plan to continue to do that. One commitment I've made is that if I have the honor of uh, being elected to this position, uh, I would not move to Washington, D.C. I would commute, so I'd be home every weekend. And the House is on session typically two out of three weeks. Uh, I would use that third week to travel the state, and I'd make a commitment to get to every county at least once a year during my term in office uh, to just listen. I think you learn a lot more when you're listening. In terms of reaching out across the aisle, uh, I've been doing that. I met with the, I've, I've, I've gone to some places that maybe they didn't expect me to show up because I think it's important to hear. I always think there's two sides to every story. I went and met with the AFL-CIO uh, union leadership up in uh, Helena. Uh, I've met with uh, uh, a number of the uh, environmental groups. I met with uh, Lantani at the uh, Backcountry uh, 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 Hunters and Anglers. Uh, met and and that's what I did when I considered the the mine over in uh, Paradise Valley. It, it was in my mind. It's I'm not coming to this job with any particular ideology. I'm coming to it with a business perspective and a uh, set of experience, having negotiated literally thousands and thousands and thousands of contracts with many many organizations to find. And what I did in all those scenarios was I found the common ground to make sure that, and, and the way you do that is by, this is the thing that's so honestly uh, repulsive about Washington, D.C. right now. We see all this infighting, the, this caucus, that caucus, and, and honestly, the American people are just fed up with it. That's what I'm hearing when I'm meeting with them in cafes and staying in their homes and traveling around the state. We need to bring principles to this to find the common ground, to, and I will work across the aisle to do that, just like I did with the, uh, the mine situation in uh, Paradise Valley. I think it's interesting that you said that you're the backcountry horseman. Uh, I was there at that meeting, and you sent a DVD, and and also I have to say too that uh, I've been. You in, must be thinking about a different meeting. Well, it was, this was uh, this was the one that was, it just happened in Pulse, and it was the national, it was the uh, statewide meeting, and um, you know, and I, of course, and uh, I've met with the AFL CIO, and all these unions are endorsing me on this, you know, and as as well as the Meyer Metal Group. So I just want to make a point that well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Quist, I want to ask you. You said that. I love, no one comes in here and says I'm not going to work with the other people or that I'm not. It, it, we haven't we haven't heard that, but we, we everybody says that they they like talking and they like being meeting. But what what issue is it that you're willing to to maybe part company with your own party even and, and work across the aisle? What issue would that be, Mr. Mr. Gianforte gave the example of mining mm -hmm. uh, and regulations in the paradise. What, where where would you be willing to part with? Well, I the think Dems? that. I think that you know how you do this is with uh, collaborative uh, forest uh, pro projects. <clears throat> There's a project that I'm following, <clears throat> excuse me, very closely, and it's it's a it's a project called Wood for Haiti that was started by these gentlemen five years ago, and it, the whole idea was to take beetle killed lumber that was in the forest, and they worked with uh, architects and builders and put together um, packages to send down to Haiti. Go to for this to this that that ravaged country. Well, of course, after spending all this time on it, there was so much corruption in Haiti that uh, that it didn't work out in that situation. But I think this would be a perfect situation for the the, the people of Montana, you know, to uh, to build uh, community centers and hospitals and housing uh, on reservations as well, you know. And so these are uh, these are uh, what I would call a win-win-win situation where you're you're involving the you're taking all that beetle kill. Um, timber out of the forest so it would not burn, you're uh, giving money to the Wood Products Association, and you're also providing jobs for putting these together, and then you also have the the uh, communities that have the benefit of having these. these Help places. me understand how that's reaching across the aisle to the Republicans. I, I, I'm well, I think, it, I think in a lot of ways uh, that, that uh, you know, with the forest products, you know, I think that that's something that's, uh, you know, to me, that's how you do it in Montana. You know, you, you get everybody to the table and you come up with a common <clears throat> common solution that works for everybody. And so that's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of a collaborative situation. So I think that that's, that's working across the aisle. Anytime that you can collaborate with somebody and get a win-win situation like that, that's a perfect example. Okay. Um, I'm still not sure how that was Republican, but uh, I want to switch formats. Well, I, okay, to... I'll just answer that. Sure. You no, know, I think that, you know, that uh, I think that, you know, what we have to realize is that, that things will benefit in Washington, D.C., things that will benefit the people of Montana. You know, I will be in all for it. That's they're my boss. You know, but but okay. things that work against the, uh, the the people of Montana, then of course I will oppose. Okay. 
Um, okay, so this we're switching formats because our time is is drawing uh, it's it's drawing a little closer. Uh, I want to uh, remind you to go over because we're going to switch it up a little. I'm going to ask each question or e the last two questions of each of you, but they're not going to be the same question because they're issues that were brought up within your own campaign. And I'm not going to, in fairness, give the other person a chance to respond. If, if yeah. you do, I will I will have to be the typical bullheaded, ugly person that I am, and 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 thank you for not commenting because again, we want to. Uh, these are these are issues that are that have been brought up with each one of your respective mm -hmm. campaigns, not necessarily the other. Uh, Mr. Quist, you answered the first uh, question uh, last time, so it will be Mr. Gianforte's uh, question this time, and then we'll, we will ask you a different question. Mr. Gianforte, I want to ask you a question about your views on religion and how it would affect your voting as a congressman. In an interview a week ago, you told Montana Public Radio Sally Mock that you believed God created the world, but refused to say whether you believed in evolution, leaving us to assume that you do not. Your involvement opposing Bozeman's uh, non-discrimination ordinance gives us some Montanans concern that you may vote your religion regardless of how Montanans view, feel. Should those who don't agree with your religious views or hold no religious views be concerned with how you vote when it comes to science and social issues? And when will your religion be a guidepost for how you vote? Okay, so um, I am a Christian. <clears throat> Faith is important to me. Uh, I will, uh, I'll try and address some of the individual things, but I think the, the important thing is I am not running to impose my religious views on anyone. Uh, that's what our First Amendment says. It says we have freedom of religion. And uh, uh, that's just not my objective. I think discrimination is wrong. I think that when we pass ordinances that uh, we should look at ordinances that protect people from discrimination. And we've got to balance that. And it's a tough needle to thread. Uh, and I think from a federal perspective, those decisions are best made at the state level, not at the federal level. And that's on the one particular area. Okay. Um, and, you know, I do, I, like many Montanans, I believe God created the earth, you know, and that was a long time ago. Uh, I wasn't there. Uh, and I know that uh, as a scientist, I know things have been changing since then. Um, it's not the topic that typically comes up when I'm out meeting with people about whether their kids can stay in the state and should we have a higher or lower tax rate and how do we solve health care costs. Uh, but uh, I want to be clear that uh, I'm not running to force my views on anybody. Uh, but I'll also fiercely defend every Montanan's right to believe what they want to believe. Okay. Mr. Quist. Uh, reporting by the Billings Gazette and other media has shown a trail of un per, uh, unpaid personal bills. You have said that these were uh, due to medical conditions, but you appear to have been working during the time you said. How can you expect voters to trust trust what's what's happening with you? Help, help us explain that. It seemed to create a, a lack of trust. Well, you know, the thing is, <clears throat> first of all, you know, I've gone through health care issues that, that many people in the state of Montana have. <clears throat> you know, this this was a perfect storm that my family faced, you know, and... Uh, and we had we had our health issues, but we powered through it, and we paid our bills, everyone. And and I think that you know, listening to uh, healthcare issues that everyday Montanans face, I think a lot of people would relate to me on this. Um, and and I could have declared bankruptcy, and uh, but we didn't do that. That's not the Montana way. We powered through, and uh, quite frankly, uh, many people have approached me in some of our healthcare rallies, and and have uh, thanked me for for being a voice for the same kind of issues that they have. So I think this really qualifies me because rather than being insulated, you know, and not being able to relate to the kind of issues that they go through, I've experienced them and we got through those and we paid our, our, our uh, tax liens just like Mr. Jean Forty paid his tax liens. Well, I got a question for that. Uh, you said that you paid them. We checked as late as last, last week and there is still a, um, I believe it's a $10,000 uh, bill out there from Wells Fargo. So that's not necessarily true, is it? Well, the, we're talking about the tax liens. You know, we had an issue where uh, we were in, we were, uh, when our, our house was to be, we were actually selling half of our ranch, but there was a, a property line uh, problem where it went right through the middle of the house. And so it took us many years and that is just being resolved as we speak. And I can't really speak too much about that because of non-disclosure agreements, but, but this will be settled, you know, and, and when, that's, when that's taken care of, then all of that will be taken care of. Okay. Mr. Quist, do you get the first question again? And this is uh, this is an individual question, then Mr. Gene Forte, and then we will be uh, right at time. Uh, Mr. Quist, you have name recognition, but you don't have you have little political experience. And many of the issues facing the federal government, like trade, health care, foreign policy, 
They're incredibly complex. What makes you believe that you can just step into the fray and serve Montana with no background in political experience? Well, you know, I really feel like, you know, I've been representing the state all my life. You know, I've, uh, I've been to every geographical area and I've, uh, I've, and I've had and, and been in touch with every demographic, you know, so I know the state of Montana. They know me. I've lived life on the ground here and I go understand the, the issues that people face, you know. And so uh, as far as trade agreements, you know, my family still has uh, ranching and farming and, and I'm very much aware of, of the issues that they face in those regards. As far as health care, you know, I, I've experienced, you know, some of the most uh, incredibly tough times that, that many Montanans and many Americans have gone through, you know, so who better to stand up for the people of Montana than someone who's experienced those very things. Okay, great. Mr. Gianforte, the last question is yours. During a meeting last week, one of your supporters characterized the press as an enemy of the people, even holding up uh, his, his hands as if to choke. Instead of denouncing it, you joked that there were more of your supporters than the press. You've urged people to cancel their subscriptions and others, and, and at times you've said that you don't read certain newspapers. Help us understand your views on both loving the First Amendment and a free press, and why you seem to suggest ganging up on a reporter. Well, that was a joke, okay. and, and, we, and, and everyone in the room got it because everybody laughed, uh, including the reporter. Okay. Um, so, but I, you know, I, uh, I think the, the uh, freedom of the press has obligations that go both ways. And, you know, I have to say during the uh, race last year, um, uh, we didn't all always agree. And I will be honest with you, I, I personally got frustrated. And at times I probably responded in ways that were not appropriate. Uh, and for that, I apologize. Uh, but I will say that, um, for, uh, for me, that's behind me, and I'm ready to move forward. And I think that's how you build relationships. And I think the fact that uh, uh, we, uh, as a campaign, reached out and tried to encourage this sort of forum for open discussion so that the people of Montana could hear the views of the two of us, I think is relevant and important. And uh, you have my commitment that uh, you know, we'll be open and honest in our discussions back and forth. And, and uh, again, I, I, I stand by my statements about the First Amendment. I think that uh, the reason a forum like this is so important is that uh, this is an important decision for the people of Montana. And there is a real choice here between uh, us two candidates and uh, uh, the, on issues of national defense, on health care, on tax policy, uh, on uh, Second Amendment rights. Uh, there are clearly different views. And I think that the role you have in getting that out is important. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. I want to thank both uh, both candidates. We came in at 61 minutes. I want to thank the, the viewers on Facebook. This will be on our site, so not only the people listening in live, but the people who will be coming back to it. Thank you for both of your time. This is an incredibly condensed time, so these minutes were probably three times more valuable than the normal campaign seasons. Thank you to the campaigns. Thank you, uh, and uh, best best of luck in the next month. Thank, yeah, thank you, you for exploring this new frontier with us. <coughs> yeah. Good this environment. Thank this, you. this is a frontier state after all. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Rob. Thank you. Nice job. Is, is the camera off?